Welcome, everybody, to another episode of So What Is Your Point? Today, Stephen and I have a very special guest. It could be that you've got to a certain level of success to date, and you're struggling to get to another place. Our guest today is a leadership coach and helps business owners, CEOs, and executives solve their biggest pains, dysfunctions, and key challenges. Then they are able to turn their teams into a well-oiled machine that contributes dramatically to their bottom line. Help me welcome today, coach and consultant, Mr. Henry Chigi. Welcome, Henry. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Steve. It's good to be here today. Um, and thank you for the nice introduction. <laughs> even, well, if you're, we're... <laughs> even if you wrote it yourself. <laughs> yeah, I love that. All right. Hey, hey let's, uh, Henry, let's talk about challenges of leadership communication and, and how that comes about in building a well-oiled team. So what do you see as the challenges leaders face in communicating? I think the biggest challenge leaders face is, is a personal one for them. Most leaders think it's a lot of times they look at the people, you know, it's those people who aren't listening. They're not, they're not hearing what I say. And what really is going on, I think so often for leaders is that the first step is to become an extraordinary listener as a leader, is you really need to tune up you're listening of others like what they say is the most important thing you got to do in that moment is to hear what they have to say, what they say, what they don't say, what their body says, what their emotional state says. And then once they've been hurt, once they've really been hurt, then a leader has the opportunity to communicate all the things leaders do, vision, uh, strategy, tactics, the, what the company's all about, you know, all the, all the different pieces that go into what creates an extraordinary team. And, but until they learn to listen, it's like, it's just noise. So number one is listening. How important it's repetition. Well, consistency, I would call it not repetition. I the word I would use would be consistency is you want your message. You want, you want to be predictable to your team. And so you listen, you then communicate, and then you are absolutely consistent throughout your communications with that message. You don't, they don't worry about, did you wake up in a good mood that morning and what the message is going to be from the leader? It's like the thing you count on is this is the way this guy works or this woman works. <clears throat> yeah, I was kind of thinking in the context of, of marketing where people it takes seven mess seven hits on a message before somebody really understands or gets it and i was thinking that with with leadership the, the, the compass you have the consistent repetition of the same message that you're you're giving people so that six seven eight times they're hearing that message they're finally getting oh yeah he's serious about this <laughs> you're absolutely right i mean and, and the other thing is and i see this with leaders i see it with myself you know it's, it's stuff you grow through you you can't ever forget because you get caught in the habit it's like sometimes we treat communication like eh, like a vaccine you get one shot and you're done right done for the rest of your life and yet what it is it's never done it is never ever done and you can't say it too many times. That's why it's so important, I think, to have to be authentic in the way you listen to people so they trust you when you're communicating it again and again and again, that you're not you're not somehow thinking less of them. You're not somehow thinking they're not smart enough to get it the first time like kids do sometimes. Well, I already know that. Right. That's what kids do. That's yeah, what I know. Say. I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. And, and yet, and yet the reason they're saying that is because they're afraid they don't know. And so 
a lot of what you communicate to your folks is it's you communicate in a way that they get it's authentic, they, they get it that you trust them. One of the things that must come into play here is the concept of simplicity and clarity. Uh, so many people I know communicate with thousands of words more than they need to. And they can really, if they really focus on it a little bit, they can really focus it down to being authentic, like you mentioned, and also communicating with a, a way that people just get it real quickly. No, you're, I think that's right. Um, I mean, a linguist would get more into the technical side of that. But for me, it's like, I want to meet them at, at, their, at their gut level. Is I want them. I want them not to have. I don't want to say anything. It's clever that they got to figure out. I don't want it to be a puzzle. They've got to work their way through. I want them to say, "Oh, I want to see a light bulb go off." I want. I want them to get the communication, like I do in reverse when I'm listening to them. When they say something and I really get it. Oh, okay. You know, and then I'll say it back, you know, that, that stuff that we teach in communications, you know, clarify and confirm, you know, how do you delegate all those, all those stuff we teach is leadership, but they all are based on the same principles. You keep it as simple as you can and you make sure the communication is, is they just don't nod their head that they got it. They actually repeat something back to you in different language that gives you a sense that it was received. Going back to your listening concept, I'm sure you have a lot of experiences when, when you've actually been listening to somebody and you got a message that gave you an aha. Yes. You got an example of one of those? Yeah, I got a, I got a great example. I was listening one time to a guy and he was talking about things that parents and children have in common, all parents and all children have in common. And the way he described this is he described this as, this is just an idea I wanted to put out there. And if you like it, you can put it on and carry it out of the room tonight. If you don't like it, just hang it back on the hanger and leave it here, all right? This is not truth. This is just an idea I wanna give you. And he said, he said, all parents want their children to love them and all parents want their children to turn out. And then he said, and all children want their parents to love them. And all children want their parents to honor who they are. And Steve, when he said that, it's like my whole childhood played through my head. It was like all the conflict I had with my parents coming up, all the times that I was mad at them, that I thought I had the wrong parents, all of a sudden it was clear. Mm -hmm. It was clear to me that all they were doing was trying to have life turn out for me. And all I was doing was I was listening through this, this interpretation of they don't honor who I am. And it, that, that was an aha moment, but it altered forever my relationship with my parents and altered my relationship with my children. So that, that's an example of a profound aha moment for me. It still lives. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I, I don't think that a lot of leaders are really great communicators. So what are your thoughts on why leaders think they're good communicators? <laughs> <laughs> and what can I do about it? Well, leaders are like all human beings, right? I mean, they, they've taken the role of being, sometimes they're given the role of being the boss, right? Sometimes they take on the role of being the boss. Sometimes they just can't stand the way it's going and they try to lead a different direction. All right. But mm -hmm. so there, there are all kinds of people and human beings in general are poor communicators. All right. We do our best communication through stories, you know, where we tell a story that evokes an emotional response that we can relate to. Um, 
But why leaders, you know, it's like the question, why do leaders think they're great communicators and yet they're not? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I know, I know how to have them be great communicators. That's why, that's why they hire guys like me, right? I, I am in their face about what words are coming out of their mouth. And they don't get that in their workplace most of the time. They don't have, that's just not the role that they're in. And they need someone that can say, did you just hear what you said? Let me repeat that back to you. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were attempting to communicate? Really? And they don't hear it. They haven't, they haven't, they haven't tuned up their speaking. And I still think the best way to tune up a person speaking is to first tune up your listening. Well, I uh, suppose a certain amount of practice goes, practice and rehearsal goes into that and some forethought of still what you're gonna say, how it's gonna be understood and some of those pre-speaking moments where you're actually really prepared, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean. I think most of us have heard the story about how do you prepare for speech? You know, how do you prepare for what you're going to say in public? And one of the best advice I, I ever received about that was that you first decide what it is you want to communicate. Then the next thing you do is you wordsmith your first sentence. You, you have that is committed to memory and it's practiced and you have your tonal quality like you want it, you have your words you emphasize like you want it, you have the pauses like you want it. And then you wordsmith the last sentence. And the last sentence, the first sentence is what you're going to tell them about. And the last sentence is you're communicating what you told them about. You know, it's like it's the it's the bread on each side of the sandwich. And the center part, you do it, you practice it, but it's not written down. You're not reading off a teleprompter. You're letting it flow out of you because you've, you've put the framework around what you're going to communicate. And it, it gets better with practice, of course. Um, but it's that simple and in that complex all at once, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the challenges is that someone in a leadership position tends to think that everyone is like them. And I like your idea of having a sounding board so they can present a message first to someone or to a group to find out if that message is going to be something that's palatable to the per people receiving it, to the audience. Uh, I see, I've, I've seen far too many times where leaders have said, this is what we're going to do. And, and this is the new policy. And that new policy alienates a whole bunch of people and makes them angry. <laughs> And because they haven't really, they haven't thought it through well. It was a knee jerk reaction. And I think that's one of the challenges leaders have is they, to your point, they need to stop, listen, and not knee jerk speak. Otherwise, they get themselves in trouble. Yeah. Or they cause more hate and discontent than they really want to have in an organization. Well, um, in my, in my Wednesday morning memo, one recent one I did was on this sub this idea of the process of decision making. And that's really what we're talking about here. It's like, it, how, how do you go through the decision that we're going to change a policy? How do you make that decision? Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe that the optimal way to do that is to get yourself in an emotionally neutral place before you ever make any decision. It's like when you look in your life at the decisions you've made that maybe haven't turned out so well, 
If you look at them, you will find most of those were made in some emotionally charged state. They were, you were either overly enthusiastic and happy and excited and the world's a big pot of roses, or you were on the other side and I got to fix this daggum thing. It is really, really bad. All right. And I'm upset about it. And decisions that occur out of any of those kind of emotions, I guarantee are less than optimal. And sometimes they're really bad. And to kind of give an example to that, that we do every day, each of us, is when you're driving your car and you're, say, on a four lane road and it's got a yellow line down the center separating two lanes going each way. And every moment of that drive, you're making decisions about which lane I'm going to be in, how fast I'm going to go, how close I'm going to get behind the car in front of me. It's like you are making a series of decisions that allows you to accomplish your task of going from A to B. And you do it every day and you do it really successfully because you're mostly in a neutral emotional state doing that. Until someone cuts you off. Yeah. <laughs> then what happens? You have, a, you have a choice, right? Right then, do you respond to them cutting you off in an emotional state or do you go to neutral? If you're in neutral, you probably won't get involved in an accident. You won't get all your blood pressure up. And, and so those are some of the decisions we've all made that perhaps we're not proud of, or perhaps we had consequences for. So yeah, decision-making works better from an emotional neutral place, which means right for leaders, developing one's emotional maturity has got to be a key element of their success. And that's a key element of being able to communicate well. Exactly. And I was listening to your podcast, actually the last two podcasts, I think about, have been about integrity. Yeah. And how does, how integrity, you know, comes into this, this play of communication? Well, uh, integrity in a simple language, you know, I like simple language. Integrity is just doing what you say you'll do. You know, it's that simple. Do my words and my actions line up. The closer they line up exactly, the more in integrity I am. So where does that play in the leadership? It's all in leadership. He shows up in trust. If my team and the people that I communicate with, if my customers, if my stakeholders, if all of the people that I am responsible and accountable to and for know they can trust what I say will be what happens then they can make their plans, they can make their commitments, they can make their dreams, build them on top of what I've said with confidence because they, they can treat that like it's a firm foundation for what their life looks like. And at the end of the day, it's not about me anyhow as a leader, it's about them and what they want in their lives. And it's for the customers, for the employees, you know, investors, all those people, it's all about what's in it for me. And if I can be trusted as a leader to have that kind of foundation for them, then they can build their dreams on top of me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, that's, what, that's what leadership is about. And that's why integrity is important in leadership. Uh, you're going to have hear another podcast pretty soon about how do you integrate integrity into your life? because it's, it's a key concept in leadership, but it begins with the little stuff. It begins with, um, do I show up on time? If I say I'm gonna be someplace at a certain time, like us getting ready to do this podcast, was I five minutes late or was I on time or was I five minutes early? You know, it's like, it's that kind of little stuff that lets the big stuff, it's harder sometimes, but lets you do the right thing when you have the big stuff to do. Mm -hmm. How important is it to regularly 
communicate successes. In other words, praising your staff, praising your teams uh, clearly, but but uh, recognizing when they've been been successful at accomplishing something. Um, if we, if it's okay, I'm going to answer that in, in just a slightly different context. All right, but this this idea of of celebrating success, I think, is very important. I know for a long time in my career, I. I focused on outcomes, results, and I did frequent performance reviews with my people. And I used to teach, I said, well, the performance, purpose of a performance review is not for me to berate you or rash you or criticize you. The purpose of a performance review is for you to share with me those five goals we agreed to and where you are in your progress on them, and are you on target? And if not, the only legal question for me to ask you is, okay, what's the root cause? What's your action plan? And by when will you be back on target? And and I and I would do that. I had a wide span of control, and I five, and I used to say, we're going to be ruthless on the problems, and we'll be gentle on the people. And I've worked really hard to do that. But one thing I missed out when I was doing that back in the day when I was a president and chief operating officer was I didn't take time to celebrate the wins with them because I had a great opportunity in that performance review when they said that one's on target. It would have been a great opportunity and I do it today with folks. I say, okay, tell me what was the root cause of being on target? How did it go? What did you do? Did you discover something? that we can share with the rest of the team in that process of getting that on target and done. And, um, and, and so it, I think that speaks to what you're talking about, the celebration. Celebration is something to be, um, do the specific thing you're celebrating and then generalize that as broadly as you can. And so it's like something about the character of the person, the character of the organization. So you take it from specific to general when you're criticizing, when you're critiquing, you stay very specific. Never go to general. It's only the specific item that needs an alternate solution or an alternate behavior or something like that. So, um, yeah, it's really important. And I think as humans, we're wired. I know I was wired for a long time, still am. Is I, I, my brain was wired to look for what's missing or what's wrong. And yet, optimal leadership has you doing that still. You don't have to worry about that. That happens naturally with good leaders. You're always looking for what's missing or wrong. But likewise, look at least as hard for what's working, what's right. I love it. Nice, yeah. Henry, what, uh, what kind of things do you find as you work with CEOs and uh, business leaders, what kind of things do you find are common challenges amongst all the people that you work with? Um, I, I know that you try to work uh, very hard at getting transformation in people uh, so that they can really have uh, a new life, so to speak. And um, what, what kinds of things do you find uh, really are common and how do you generally approach that with people? I, I think some of the the common traits and I think it shows up in leaders because they take on responsibilities, right? For doing things, but it shows up in all of us. It's just like, I'm not good enough is a fear people have. They're gonna find out I'm really a fraud, <laughs> all right? Um, Hey, people don't like to be around me. I'm too tough or I'm too something, right? Or something like that. Or, or I really don't have permission to take that person's time up, so I'm just not going to call them. Um, all these stories we have that we think we're different, that we are the only ones that got the story. 
And yet every mm -hmm. one of us have those stories going on. And, and then the common solution is to look in your past, find out where you got the story and see if you can work your way out of it with your mind, right? That's the common solution for that stuff. I don't use the common solution. I encourage them and me, when I work on me, to go into my body, stay out of my mind, go into my body and try to find that feeling in me and allow it to be completely felt. Allow it to be embraced with me not having an agenda with it. Just allow it to be felt because I'm of the opinion that all those feelings, the fears we have, those fears are from feeling the feeling, not the feeling itself. We're afraid of feeling that feeling. And if I can allow that feeling to be felt and it's worked for me and it works for my clients, I do this with all the clients. Because something to come up and they say, well, I'm just not that, right? I'm just not a good speaker or I'm, you know, that's not me. Or We've all heard that when we talk to people, right? And I say, oh, tell me more about that. How does that feel? God, I never thought I'd be asking that question when I was younger, but now I ask it all the time. How does that feel? <laughs> and, they, and they say, well, you know, and then they'll say something and I'm, I try to poke them to get the emotion really there. And eventually it gets there and I say, would you be willing to let that go? And then I take them through a process, just like I explained. And on the other side, it's like, 95% of them in 10 or 15 minutes, the feeling is gone. The other 5% has been reduced by half or more. And I count that a big win. I have one gal tell me, she says, I've been in with a psychiatrist for 20 plus years. And in 10 minutes, you do more than it happened in 20 years. I say, that's because I don't care about the story. We're going to the root cause. We're showing you that emotion doesn't really hurt. All it wants to do is be felt. Wow, that's so fantastic. So great to hear that. Uh, it's, how you yeah, impressive. That. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of surprises me too. I mean, I was the hard nosed engineer, do it by the book, make it happen kind of guy, right? And all of a sudden, I'm not all of a sudden, this happened over many years, but. I'm in this other place these days. Well, it just goes to show that warm and fuzzy can be very hard. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, Henry, tell, tell us how uh, people who might be listening to this podcast can get in touch <laughs> with you and how do you connect with them and what are some of the ways that uh, they can initiate uh, uh, and reach out to you? Okay. Um, my uh, website is henrychidgey.com. So just my first name, last name.com. And on that website, you'll have access. You'll easily be able to see, first of all, what I'm about. It's, it's a short website. It's not a big, long, drawn out thing. Um, but there's a place in there where if you'd like to have a free discovery session with me, a 45 minute free discovery session in which you get to experience my coaching, which you've heard me do today a little bit on this podcast, but you get to experience it firsthand. My, um, my promise to you is that you'll leave that session, whether you decide you want to engage with me in one-on-one -on -one coaching or not, you will leave that session being re-energized, refocused. Uh, you'll get great value out of it. That's my commitment to you if you decide you want to do that. And there's nothing you got to do other than just sign up. I got it where you can just pick 45 minutes in my schedule and I'll be there and you'll be there and we'll do a Zoom call. So that's how that goes. Also, I have, as I referred to you yesterday or earlier in this call was I have this Henry Chigi's Wednesday morning memo and it's a short video memo of something like what we've been talking about today where something like integrity or 
or how do you get what you want in life? Do you be, do, have, or have, do, be, or, you know, is there some, is there some sequence of magic that makes it really get what you want in life? And I think they're, it's close to magic. It works pretty easy once you figure out the plan, you see what the story is. Um, but I just offer a couple of minutes of thoughts just in, and my intention is, is to perhaps have a light bulb come on, have you leave that morning more inspired to be great in whatever it is you're doing in your life. And so that's the intention. And I, you'll find that every Wednesday morning in your email box. So that's, uh, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. I'm, I'm putting together now some um, more formal group programs, webinars, things like that. And then I have an intention in this next year to put together a mastermind group of leaders that would like to work with their peers. Um, I found those to be very valuable for me. Um, and, and just, just, I think all of us need coaches. I've got coaches. I'm part of mastermind groups. I spend a lot of money on myself and personal development all the time. And I think as part of the reason I can be who I am for you, if you want that, if you want my help. So. Fantastic, Henry. We really appreciate your being on our podcast today. And uh, I hope that people will uh, follow you and learn from you as, as uh, the opportunity arises. And uh, we're just uh, very grateful to have you today. And uh, we wish you all the success in the future. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you both so much for having me today. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. So that wraps up. So what is your point? And we'll look forward to talking to you next week. Bye for now. Bye.